All right, well, this morning, as we continue our study on the Holy Spirit, uh, we're going to study this morning grieving the Spirit. Now, this is not a topic that I'm excited to give. It's not uh, one that is uplifting, so to speak. But yet, I would be negligent if I didn't give it. I have to give it because we're covering the Holy Spirit. And even in the warnings of God, His love shines through. Amen? Amen? Sometimes even more you see the love of God in the fact that He loves you enough not to leave you in the dark, not to leave you without warning. Now in John chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus tells us when the Spirit comes, He, the Spirit of truth, He will guide you into how much? All, all truth. Not all, almost all not everything but, but all truth. And as we near the end of time, that would be most prominent in what we call present truth, wouldn't it? The fact that Jesus is right now ministering in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary, that that ministry will soon close. The door of probation will soon shut. Do you believe that a God who loves you enough to have given His life for you would plead with every heart, every man, woman, and child every nation, kindred, and tongue, that the door is soon closing. He also tells us he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you what? Things to come. Now, if you were to tell me in, in another word, what are things to come, things that are future, what would you call that in the Bible? Prophecy. That's right, prophecy. Not only is the comforter, putting us in the past as far as we read the stories in the scriptures, we look at the characters as we, as we did in, in Sabbath school, and we learn from them. He's a present help in our time of need, leading us, wooing us to repentance, to victory over sin, but he does not leave us in the dark as to the future. He is the guide as it comes to prophecy. 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible reads, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Sort of the climax of prophecy, if you will, is the book of Revelation. As we're in these last days, Daniel and Revelation working hand in hand, that final call to the human heart. Was the Holy Spirit involved in the book of Revelation? Simple question. Of course he was. Revelation 1.10, as the book begins, John says, I was in the Spirit. The Spirit was leading me. He was the one dictating the words as John begins the book. To every one of the churches, he ends, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Calling every one of us to have a spiritual ear, to hear the wooing, the calling of the Spirit. It ends, Revelation 22, verse 17, just prior to the close of the book, with this wonderful invitation. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Now, in the book of Revelation, right kind of in the middle there, we have what we call the three angels' messages. It, it, it really is the reason that this church exists. Would you agree with that? This is why we're here. The last call of mercy to the world. Revelation 14, 7, as the first angel carries on, it says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. There's really three elements there that lead you to true worship. Number one, you must fear God. That's a reverential fear. We must understand that we are sinners, lost, outside of the camp, if you will, without hope unless we come to Him. And he said, come to us just as you are, right? He can forgive. He can cleanse. But there must be that realization of what and who we are before a holy God, before a righteous God. The second is to give glory to him. Now, who here has glory that they can give? I don't. Of myself, the Bible says we are what? Filthy rag. The heart is dark. There's nothing good in man. But... If we were to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and do a work of character change, 
one that would reflect his character, then we could give something back. It wouldn't be of our own. It would be a mere reflection of the righteousness of God. We must first fear him so that he can start a work in the life. Then there will be a reflection of his character where we give glory to him. And then finally, for the hour of his judgment has come, there will be and is right now an investigation going on as to see who is just a professor of the faith and who really is putting these things into action. True worship, by the way, cannot happen until these three elements are in place. There's no way that you and I could worship God with a pure heart if we didn't have reverential fear and respect, understand our position versus that of a holy, righteous God. We couldn't give glory to Him in worship if we weren't allowing the Holy Spirit to perfect that character in each one of us. And judgment is just a part of the process of this investigation we live in currently. Now, when Jesus talked of the Holy Spirit, I would like to submit to you this morning that what He said about the Holy Spirit's job is actually in the first angel's message. It's really the entirety of the first angel's message. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, John chapter 16 and verse 8, Jesus said of the Spirit, when He has come, He will convict the world of what? Sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Three things that the Holy Spirit will do. He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. That I would submit to you this morning is none other than the first angel's message of sin. In other words, we must understand that we are sinners, separated from God, must come to Him with reverential fear, understanding that He is a righteous God and we are not. He will convict the world of righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? It is right doing, right? It is those who are completely obedient to God. Can we say that righteousness would be to give glory. Who alone is righteous? Christ. God is righteous, right? And so to give glory is to reflect the righteousness back to God. And then the final thing, he will convict the world of judgment. What does the first angel end in? The hour of judgment. The three elements of the first angel's message are the three elements of the very job of the Holy Spirit. Ecclesiastes, you know, we, we typically make things very complicated. That's why I put that picture up on the screen there. You know, sometimes I feel like I hear gospel presentations and I need a flow chart like this, right? But the reality is, I like how Solomon sums up the book. He says, here are the conclusion. This is the, the whole conclusion of the matter. And what does he say? Three things. Fear God? Is that in the first angel's message? Yeah. Is that related to the fact that we're sinners? He will convict the world of sin. What else does he say? Fear God and keep His commandments. Is that righteousness? Yes, it's righteousness. It's the first angel's message. Keep His commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into what? Judgment. There's the third element. Solomon sums it up very nicely. Fear God, keep His commandments, for all this will be brought up in the judgment. Now, as I said earlier, we know that Christ is in that heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place. The final moments, that ministry of his intercession will end, I believe, very soon. He is pleading in our behalf right now, but he won't plead forever. That work will end, and he will take off those priestly garments, and he will put on that of a king, and he will come back in all his glory. And when he stands that final time, he will proclaim, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. There's only two groups that will be in the world. Those who are ready for Christ and those who are not. Now, I believe, and I know that you do too, that God loves even sinners, amen? Or we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have a chance. The Bible says He loved us while we were yet sinners, before we've even made a profession to come to Him. So I believe that He is desperate to reach every man, woman, and child with this message before that door closes. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. He is long-suffering, we're told in the book of Peter, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all, that all should come to repentance. And that word long-suffering there means exactly what it says. It's, he's suffering long. God is not just omnipresent, omnipowerful. He's also omnifeeling. And you think you're pained 
by sin. You think you're pained by the decision of the loved ones around you. How must God feel? Every hurting child, every hurting, abused person, God is intimately acquainted with. Sin has affected him more than anyone that's ever lived. And he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. But even God has a limit, doesn't he? Even God at some point will say, it is enough. I have called to every corner. I have dealt with every heart, and they will not turn to me. And even God at some point will bring an end to this gospel call. Now in Matthew 24 and verse 14, we're told that many are called, but few are chosen. I would submit to you this morning that the word many there means all. All are called. Would you agree with that? Yes. Everyone. Every one of us has been called. Everyone around us will be if they have, and they're all called. For God so loved the world, right? All are called, but few are chosen. It's a sad thing, as I stand here before you this morning, that most of the people in this world will not answer the call. It's very sad. I mean, when you think of the blood of Christ that was shed, that will not be ministered in their behalf because they've chosen not to accept it. That breaks my heart. But then there is another class that we're going to deal with this morning that's equally heartbreaking, maybe even more. And that is the class who have accepted the call, but yet in the end will not be chosen. They will not be chosen. They have professed to be a follower of Christ. They have entered into the work, but they will not finish the race. They will not be there on that day. Matthew 7 and verse 21. We know the verse well. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, what? Lord, Lord, are these Christians? Are these people who recognize Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Lord? Yeah, they're calling him Lord. These are not heathen. They're saying, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus says, He who does the will of my Father in heaven. What's the prerequisite here? Not everyone that calls upon my name, but rather he who... Say it again? Does. does. He who does the will of the Father. He who obeys my voice. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. He said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? You see what Jesus is saying very simply? Why would you call me Lord? but then not do what I say. That, the fact that you're not doing what I say means that I'm not really what? Lord. Yeah. This is brought out in many of his parables. One of the most famous, by the way, is the parable of the ten virgins. Now, what is a, a woman in Bible prophecy? A church. So we're not talking about heathen here. We're not talking about the outsiders, the lost. They all equally went out to meet their Lord. They all went out to, the, to meet the bridegroom. They all had lamps. At some point, they all had oil. Well, what's the problem? When the call came, there were five of them that the Bible calls foolish. And they did not have the oil. Now, what is the oil? It's the Holy Spirit. That's right. Matthew 25, verses 11 and 12. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Again, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you. You were not vigilant. You did not watch unto prayer. You have no oil. You see, it's possible to grieve away, to lose the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 is really our text for this morning. The Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You ever been grieved? I mean, really grieved? It hurts. It's one of the most painful things that you can go through. More than I would say physical. I think grief in the, in the pit of the heart can be one of the most despairing things that you can go through. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is of such a personality that you can grieve Him. You can pain Him to the depths of His being. And the reason is because He in all actuality is trying to save you with all of heaven. And you and I could be possible that we are pushing him, that we are denying him as Lord. Now, when it talks here about the seal, it says, by whom you were sealed. We, we studied this together before, but the seal of God actually has two phases. Do you remember that? 
Just like when Jesus healed the man who couldn't see, he was blind, he had two touches from Jesus. The first touch, he could see men and they were walking and he said he, he could see them and they looked as if they were what? Trees. Trees. And then Jesus touched him again and he could see everyone perfectly. In the same way, the seal of God has two phases, two touches, if you will. The first is the entering work, and then the seal of God mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 is the closing of that seal. It is the completion of it. God's people at that point cannot be moved. But we can grieve away the Holy Spirit and lose that first seal. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, we're told, And we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who do what? obey him. Now, I like to look at Scripture sometimes in the inverse. If God is giving his Spirit to those who obey him, what would happen to the Spirit with those who don't obey him? Be taken away. Yeah, they're grieving away, they're pushing away, they're becoming calloused to the call and the wooing of the Holy Spirit, and therefore the Holy Spirit is being pulled back. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus said, therefore I say to you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Now, I've talked to many, I'm sure you have too, who've been very concerned. Did I commit blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? You ever felt that way? The good news is if you have a concern about it, you haven't done it, amen? If you have any kind of concern, any kind of anxiety about it, then you know that the Holy Spirit is still working. I like this from Review and Herald. She says, no one need look upon the sin against the Holy Ghost as something mysterious and indefinable. The sin against the Holy Ghost is the sin of persistent refusal to respond to the invitation to repent. It's when we know something's wrong. We know we're making the wrong decision. We're taking the wrong path. And we feel him saying, stop, don't pull back, turn around. But yet we stay on the course and we stay on the course until eventually, the conscience becomes hardened to the voice of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Eventually, those who used to feel the pings and the pangs of the Holy Spirit dealing with their heart, they don't hear that anymore. They don't feel it anymore. And the reason it's unforgivable is because they will not even ask for forgiveness for it because they feel no guilt. Another very clear statement. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not lie in any sudden word or deed. It is the firm determined resistance of truth and evidence. In other words, it's not one massive change that happens in one decision. It's the small steps that we're making every day. It's the small steps that we're making whether we're going towards God or away from God. Very dangerous to be going the opposite direction, but they're so imperceptive that most are even unaware that they're doing it. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now the Spirit, who, who is saying this? The Spirit. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 2 Thessalonians tells us that so great will be this falling away that it really announces, if you will, the entrance of the man of sin. It says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day the coming of Christ will not come unless the falling away comes first. The Bible's clear that before Jesus comes, a majority of God's people even will fall away from the truth. They will blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. They will be shaken out of God's fold. Now this is nothing new. If you look back at the history of ancient Israel, we really see the same thing, don't we? We're told in Scripture that they who were once saved because of their disobedience, because of their lack of faith, became lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. Isn't it interesting? The rock is Christ. The rock is struck, and what comes out of the rock? Water. Who does the water represent? The Holy Spirit. They're drinking of the Spirit. They're being led by the rock. 
And then it ends by saying, but with most of them God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. When you read the historical account of the Israelites, it's not a very good one, is it? Bittering, complaining, constantly unhappy with the leadings of God, whether it be the food that he provides, the message of the health message of their day, or where it is that God's leading them, they're unhappy and they're complaining about every step. Hebrews chapter 3, 16 through 18 says, speaking of the same group of people, for who having heard, rebelled indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, and to whom did he swear that he would not, they would not enter into his rest, but to those who did not, and there it is again, obey. Jude verse 5 very simple. He says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Is it possible to fall away, to lose your first love, to fall away from the truth in such a way that you grieve the Holy Spirit until it's too late? Is it possible? It is. Matter of fact, as we look at where we are in history, the seven churches, the last church before Jesus comes, it's very interesting. It's described as thinking they're rich, increased of goods, have need of nothing. Jesus says, you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But here's something I find very interesting about that church. At the end, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, if Jesus is standing at the door and knocking, is he on the inside or the outside? He's on the outside. Now, as we've studied the Holy Spirit together, how does Jesus come to the heart right now? Prayer. Prayer, but through what medium? Through the Holy Spirit, right? Isn't it the Spirit that Christ works through to come to you and I personally? If Jesus is saying to the last church before he comes, I stand at the door and knock, he's on the outside of the church, which tells me that the Holy Spirit would be where? on the outside, not on the inside. It's a very somber thing to think about. But the promise is, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, a very intimate fellowship, and he with me. Do you want that this morning? I know I do. I know as I analyze my own life, I see small steps in both ways, don't you? And I want to be going in the right direction. I want to be making large steps in the right direction. And as I think about the message this morning and the warning about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, I do not want to be in the dark to my own heart. Do you? I want the true witness to speak to me. And there are some things in my life I know I've got to clean up. And I'm going to make those decisions now while today is today. Amen? I pray that you will too. There's a character in the Bible that came to my mind as I was preparing this message that I think sort of exemplifies this concept. It's King Saul. Now, the people cried out for a king. We know it wasn't God's will that they have a king. It was an impossible job, really. When you think about the power and the pomp that would come with that, God didn't want any man to hold that position. But the fact that he bent towards their will, he also supplied Saul with the tools and the ability to do the job. I like this in Patriarchs and Prophets. She says, When called to the throne, Saul had a humble opinion of his own capabilities and was willing to be instructed. Is that a good thing? Yes. Amen. He was deficient in knowledge and experience and had serious defects of character. Put me in that character defect category too. But... The Lord granted him the Holy Spirit as a guide and helper and placed him in a position where he could develop the qualities requisite for a ruler of Israel. All his biddings are also his enablings. But we know the story of Saul. We know that once pride started to develop in his character, once he was in the position for a while, he started to make some terrible decisions. We know that the warnings of God through Samuel the prophet came unheeded by Saul. And step by step, Saul began the grieving process of the Holy Spirit. Now, oftentimes you'll read that Saul seems to have confessed, right? We read here in 1 Samuel 15. This was after he was supposed to annihilate 
all the Amalekites, and he didn't. And he gave all kinds of reasons and excuses. But finally he gave in, and Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. There's the excuse, right? Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Patriarchs and prophets were told it was not sorrow for sin, but a fear of its penalty that actuated the king of Israel as he entreated Samuel. I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. It wasn't real repentance. You know, I, I analyze my own life. I ask you to do the same this morning. Do you find yourself repenting over the same sin over and over again? This ought not be, friends. Real repentance is a 180, isn't it? It's a change in the life. And if we find ourselves on our knees repenting from the same sin over and over again, we may be grieving the Holy Spirit because we're not experiencing His power. In other words, it's possible to be sorry that you are in sin because you're worried about what? The penalty, rather than you really want a character change from that sin in your life. I heard an evangelist say one time, and I had to laugh, you know, sometimes we crawl away from sin just hoping it catches up to us. And I wonder, when we go to our knees, if we're not already planning for the next episode. Be careful, friends. We may be grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Now you find Saul, as this downward slope continues, getting even to a point, and I'm sure you've read this, where he's throwing spears at his own son, right? And at David, just a complete roller coaster ride of emotions and hatred, losing control. What are the gifts of the Spirit? Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit should say the fruit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self control. Did Saul have any self control? Did he have any of these qualities? Or was the downward slope, the grieving away the Holy Spirit, becoming painfully evident as he was a roller coaster of emotions? Throwing spears the one moment, acting as if he was a loving father the next. If you find yourself in a roller coaster, if you are analyzing your own life and realizing that maybe you are not exhibiting these fruits, be careful, friends. We may be in a position where we're grieving the Holy Spirit of God. The story continues as Saul becomes so desperate to hear the words of God after Samuel dies. He has no more voice from the prophet. He so grieved the Holy Spirit that God is not speaking through the other men of God. And he goes to seek after who? The witch of Endor. Now this is really fascinating because Saul had previously banished the witches from his territory. Why would he do that? Because it was strongly forbidden by God to have any dealings with anyone who was a necromancer who claimed to be able to communicate with the dead. And of course we know the dead know how much? Nothing. We know the truth that the dead know nothing. So a witch is merely communicating with wicked or evil spirits, right? Completely makes sense why God would say, banish this practice from your kingdom. Stone those who practice this thing. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 9 He's speaking to the witch and she says, Look, you know what Saul, because she didn't know it was King Saul. You know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? I think one of the other signs of grieving the Holy Spirit of God is when you find yourself doing things that you said you would never do. Things that are completely contrary to the things you know to be right but yet you find yourself doing them. King Saul, who at one time banished the spiritists and the mediums, is now going to those very people for advice, for counsel. I remember when I was in elementary school, we had someone come in and talk to us about smoking. Maybe you had a similar talk. And I remember as an elementary school student sitting there and making the decision, I will never smoke. I'll never do it. What do you think I did when I got older? <laughs> yeah, gave in to peer pressure. But I still remember the first cigarette that I lit. I remember hearing that still small voice in my mind saying, you said you would never do that. 
you said you would never make that choice. But I kicked against the goads. You know, I powered through because, you know, the first cigarette's never enjoyable. How anybody ever gets addicted to that, I'll never know. Because you really got to power through that first one, right? It's horrible. It's not something that's addicting on the first puff, but you do because of peer pressure, whatever elements are there. If you find yourself doing things, saying things, feelings about people that you thought you would never have, be careful, friends. You, I, could be in the process of grieving away the Holy Spirit. So bad did this story become that you know the witch of Endor, she gave a prophecy to Saul. And what was that prophecy, good or bad? It was bad. Basically, tomorrow, you and your sons are going to die. Now, this became a self-fulfilling prophecy because Saul, believing what the witch had said, had how much hope? None. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly, right? I give you hope, not as the world gives you hope. Saul has none. In complete desperation, believing what the witch has said, as his army is failing, he cries out for his armor bearer to kill him. In other words, he's just so deceived, so out of God's grace, no hope that he takes his own life. He becomes suicidal. 1 Samuel 31.4, Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. Steps of Christ, page 32. Listen closely. Beware of procrastination. You know, why put off till tomorrow what you can put off to the next day? Beware. Beware of procrastination. Today is the day, right? Do not put off the work of forsaking your sins and seeking purity of heart through Jesus. Here is where thousands upon thousands have erred to their eternal loss. I will not here dwell upon the shortness and uncertainty of life, but there is a terrible danger, a danger not sufficiently understood in delaying to yield to the pleading voice of God's Holy Spirit, in choosing to live in sin. For such this delay really is. Sin, however small it may be esteemed, can be indulged in only at the peril of infinite loss. What we do not overcome will overcome us and work out our destruction. Did you hear that? What you and I don't overcome is going to happen. It's going to overcome us. And it will work out our destruction. Do you believe that this morning, that your life is like a vapor? We have such a small time. No, none of us sitting here knows what kind of time we have left, do we? We really don't. Only God knows. And that's why we're told, live each day as if it's your last, right? You may have plans for the next year, the next two years. Brothers and sisters, you might as well just throw them in the garbage can. Live today as if it is your last. Amen? Heed the call of the Holy Spirit. Let Him plan your life. Amen? If you have that peace, if you're walking in, in the Spirit in such a way that you have nothing between you and God, you can have that peace, that assurance of salvation, and you don't have to fear the future. But if we're making decisions, if we know we're in that downward spiral, brothers and sisters, we are on such dangerous ground. Amen? Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 says, Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know, if the first cigarette you ever smoked killed you on the spot, I don't think we'd have a problem with smoking in our society. Do you? It's because sin takes a very slow, methodical tearing down of our nature that we don't even see it. We don't recognize that it's coming or that it's happening or what it's doing to us. I probably shared this story before, but it's always stuck with me. I remember a missionary who was a dentist who flew to a foreign island and he was going there to do dental work as part of his missionary outreach and it broke his heart because all the kids who come running up to the plane smiling and laughing because he's there. Someone knew. They had no teeth. Their teeth were all rotted out. And he's thinking, what will I do? And he learned later that on that island they grew sugar cane and the kids were just chewing on the sugar cane raw. Just, it just rotted their teeth out. I mean, there's nothing left. 
It didn't happen with the first bite. It never does, right? Well, maybe in the Garden of Eden it did. But the reality is that Satan, as we're told in the Garden of Eden, is what kind of snake? He's very subtle. He's very subtle. And we may think, hey, I've been doing this for so long, nothing's happened to me. I've been doing this activity and I see other people doing it. It doesn't seem to be such a bad thing. Be careful, brothers and sisters. We may be in the very act of grieving away the Holy Spirit as we sit here this morning. This is a picture of Wu Yangming. He's known as the Chinese daredevil. No ropes, no safety harness. He climbs these towers for kicks, sometimes for money. Gets these pictures and somehow he manages to get up there and he's also holding you know, one of these selfie sticks that he takes out and takes pictures of himself, does all these crazy things. You know, here he is using one of those scooters going around the perimeter of this building. No safety net, no harnesses. Last year in November, he fell to his death. 2017. Here he is on a cell phone tower. You know how skinny they are. Who here is surprised? Anybody? I'm not. You know, I don't think the angels are surprised either when we just play and play and play with sin. They can see it coming. All of heaven is pleading for you and I to stop, turn around. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Could you crucify him this morning? If I gave you the nails, would you do it? Why do we think that sin doesn't do it? Why are we so convinced? How is the enemy whispered into our ear and we believed it that somehow sin doesn't hurt God? Brothers and sisters, there is nobody that hurts more than God by our decisions. And you think, well, it's my life. I'll do whatever I want. He bought your life on the cross. Amen? Amen. He bought you. He paid a horrendous price. For you. Don't throw it away. Don't grieve away the Spirit of God. Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? The good news, brothers and sisters, is that today we have a new day. Amen? The mere fact that you're here, the mere fact that you're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit this morning, it's hope. God is not a God of despair. He's long-suffering and He's calling to you and I this morning, turn. Don't grieve me. Don't fight against me. I have only your best interest in mind. How will we make sure we're on the upward stairs? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It would be a great verse to memorize. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be, what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transform the mind. What are you putting in? Put in the Word of God. Spend that time, that precious time, first thing in the morning, in His Word. Spend every day, spend an hour in His Word in prayer, in witnessing. You know, some people struggle even beyond that. And I, I found this quote in Acts of the Apostles, page 105. She's talking about the early disciples who started to fall away from the truth. And this is what she said. They had forgotten 
that strength to resist evil is best gained by what? Aggressive service. Are you struggling? Throw yourself into aggressive service for God. Spend that time in the Word, yes. Spend that time in prayer. It, you must. Don't do that with, and then do aggressive service. Or don't not do that and do aggressive service. You want to be connected to God. But if you're still struggling, throw yourself into aggressive service. Pray for God to lead you to, into a Bible study with somebody. We're going to need Bible workers here. We're going to need door-to-door -door work. We're going to need lots of things here as we grow and we begin to really answer the call of the Holy Spirit to minister. Throw ourselves into the work. Amen? As we close, I'm reminded of Jesus' prayer for Peter. You know, Jesus knew Peter was about to be shaken up. Peter was about to fall. And he said to him, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. You ever see them sift wheat? You know, they have that, that sifter that they shake it. Satan had asked for, for Simon. He said, I'm going to shake him. He's not going to last. But Jesus said, not so fast, right? I will pray for him. And when you return, Simon, when you return, you and I are about to face a massive shaking. You know that? Have you read that? We're about to face momentous times ahead of us. We need to be listening to that still small voice now because he who is faithful in little, be faithful in much. If we're not faithful in little, what's going to happen? You may think, oh, when that day comes, I'm going to stand. When, this, when that Sunday law comes, I won't be able to be moved. Brothers and sisters, if we're moved on the little things, we got no chance. A great shaking is about to commence. I want to be found on the inside when it's over, don't you? Revelation 7 says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Now this is the second part of that seal I was talking about earlier. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the grass, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now notice, they were called servants before they were sealed. Doesn't mean they're going to be sealed. There's an investigation. There's a process here to determine whether they truly are servants of the living God. Amen? And God says, don't, don't allow anything. Don't allow those winds to blow. The strife is coming. The mighty shaking is about to rip what we know of as church apart. Don't allow it to happen until my servants are sealed so that they cannot be moved. Manuscripts, page 173. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for what? For the shaking, it will come. She says, indeed, it has begun already. That's 1902. Judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. How merciful is God. Amen? If it was started in her day and there were judgments in the land in her day, how much more today? Do you see judgments in the land? Are there fires in this country? Floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, all around us. We haven't seen anything yet. But God's mercy is so great toward us. Today could be the last call we don't know. That's why we started with Hebrews 11, or Hebrews 3, verse 15. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Turn to God this morning. Ask Him to reveal where you may be taking small steps in the wrong direction.